when I teach Mojo, I break it down into six separate parts. The preparation stage, the filming stage, the editing stage, the audio stage with you know, narration and music, uh, the special effects stage, and the um, delivery stage. Um, today, we'll just be focusing on the second stage, which is the filming stage. So that's why it's basically called creative filming with a smartphone. I was a journalist for 20 years in five countries. I worked for newspapers in Australia, uh, Bangkok Post newspaper in Thailand. Uh, I'm just going through chronologically the PA and BBC TV in the UK. Uh, I worked for Television New Zealand and I've worked for the Middle East Broadcasting Centre in Dubai. Um, I was a teacher of journalism in four countries, including China and America and the Emirates. Um, I returned to journalism in 2011 with the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong, updating and working on their, uh, their new website. Um, and since 2004, I've been a part-time professor of mobile journalism at Christiania University in Norway. Um, the rest of the time, I write books, uh, make videos. I've, uh, last year, I wrote, filmed, directed and edited two short fiction movies. Um, and the rest of the time, well, until lockdown, I was training journalists and I've trained mojos in journalists uh, as mojos in 20 countries. A summary of today, um, I'm going to suggest to you that smartphones give you the opportunity for very being much more creative with your filming, but it does help to have some training. So I'm going to focus today, as I said, on creative filming techniques. I'll use examples from some of my own videos. I apologize if these are boring, but I think it's appropriate. If I'm going to talk to you about doing something, I should show you how it works. Um, I'm going to suggest very strongly that the basics of filming still apply. So no wobbly footage. So use a tripod or a gimbal or some other st stabilizer. You'd also need decent audio and you need to clear and you need to know what your story is. And the context today will be uh, journalism, though I admit, I've, as I've mentioned, I've made a few uh, few feature movies. I've written, I started writing film scripts a couple of years ago and I've written five. And as they say, all opinions are my own. They are not those of the university that I work at in Norway. What do I mean by mojo? I mean that it's journalism conducted solely with a mobile phone, a cell phone, a smartphone. Everything is done with a smartphone. So you film with a smartphone, you edit on the smartphone, you add the narration and the music and the special effects on the smartphone. Any headlines, text and delivery, it's all done on the smartphone. And with training, it's possible to make a broadcast quality video in, in a day. Uh, I'll show you one which is still my record from pressing record in the field to delivery to the South China Morning Post website took just over two and a half minutes. I'll, I'll tell you how I did that later. Uh, what's that number? That number is the number of hours of video put online every day. It's at least two million. Nobody really knows how many, but lots of Google alone is 144,000 hours or something every hour. It's just, there's a lot of video out there online. So how do you make your video stand out? I would suggest that good quality images, good quality story planning, good quality audio, high quality editing, and something extra that, that, that some people call creativity. Um, I'm going to suggest to you that editing is a big factor in creativity. Editing creates quality. So the, the photographic editor on the newspaper improves the quality of the 
work of the photographers who submit the work to the editor. The copy editor improves the quality of the text provided by the print reporter and so forth. So editing is a major factor in deriving quality. What is creativity? Well, I'm going to take you sideways slightly about how your brain works because your brain is a major factor in, 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 in creativity. A couple of small facts. Your brain, weigh, brain weighs about 2% of your body weight, but it needs at least 20% of the oxygen you absorb. So f interestingly, obviously, so facto breathing is really important. The quality of the oxygen that your body absorbs is a beginning factor in, in making sure your brain is functioning properly. I introduce you to Dr. Paul McLean, who, uh, who introduced the notion of the, the triune brain, the three-in-one brain. So the human brain has a, a core, a basic brain, a primitive brain called the reptilian brain. It has a, a, what's called the limbic system, or the paleomammalian brain, which is the brain of the, of the mammal, the creature that suckles its young. And a hint there is that um, when, when mothers suckle their young, there's usually a bonding takes place, an emotional link. So the limbic system is connected with memory. And the neomammalian, also known as the neocortex, is the thinking brain. And that's the brain that I'm going to be talking about today. So your neocortex has two distinct hemispheres. They're about the size of your clenched fist. And if you hold your clenched fist together, um, they are separate. And you have to imagine them being linked by a thing called the corpus callosum, which is a very thin five to seven millimeter sheath of nerves that, that actually operate as like a switchboard between, between the two hemispheres. A man called Tony Buzan, who sadly died last year, I worked with him many years ago, um, extrapolated this. He was first of all the inventor of the mind map that was based on his knowledge of the different hemispheres. Um, a guy, Dr. Robert Ornstein, got a Nobel Prize for medicine back in the early 70s for his discovery that the different hemispheres have different functions. True creativity really only occurs when both hemispheres are working together. So people used to think that I'm right brain, I'm creative. I'm left brain, I'm analytical. It's not the case. If you are composing music, for example, you are using both hemispheres of your brain. And so some of you will remember Archimedes, the famous um, Greek philosopher who allegedly um, discovered the answer to a problem and ran, allegedly, it's a story, a myth, who knows, he may or may not have, he streaked down the streets of Athens screaming out Eureka, which is Greek for I've got the answer. The story goes that he discovered many of his ideas while sitting in the bath. Why the bath? Well. We've all experienced it. After a tough day, we have a bath. Uh, we sing in the shower. There's something about the connection between water and the bath which helps us feel relaxed. And so creativity seems to work much more powerfully when we are relaxed. So that's my first tip to you. How do you get relaxed? Well, there are lots of things. Um, journalists used to get relaxed by going to the pub and drinking several pints. It gets expensive and dangerous over. The, and, and so basically, we're trying to find natural ways to get relaxed. One is a technique called sushi breathing. It comes from South Korea. The principle is that behind it is that you spend more time on the exhale than you do on the inhale. So if I count to five on my inhale, I have to make sure that when I exhale, that I go beyond five into six or seven. 
uh, you're all aware of the, the, the lots of work done on mindfulness and meditation. Um, stimulants, unfortunately, things like coffee and tea tend to increase the pulse. Um, music is a great way to, to, to get relaxed. And the ideal is what is called Baroque music, which is its feature is 60 beats a minute. And you can actually reduce your pulse, your heart rate, and become more relaxed by listening to music and doing things like meditation. And uh, as an example, um, I measured my, uh, my blood pressure. Uh, this is a couple of months ago under orders from my doctor I want he wanted a weekly readings of my blood pressure so I'd re I, I measured my blood pressure it was high and then I um, meditated for 20 minutes and then I measured my blood blood pressure again twice more and it had dropped 20 points on both the the upper and lower level so you can actually improve your health through things like meditation and mindfulness just to repeat creativity works best when the two hemispheres of the neocortex are working together this. so just to repeat this corpus callosum is quite an important part of your brain how do you connect your hemispheres how do you know when they are um, uh, working I have to stop the share for a moment. Stick out your thumb on one finger, one hand, and little finger of the other, and then swap. Have a go. That's a sign that your hemispheres are your Caucasian kinesiology. Um, it's sometimes shortened as brain gym. That's kinds of exercises that um, that involve crossing the midpoint so if you look at your human body and draw a line vertically down the middle you'll see that we're actually two two fairly identical halves you know you've got matching eyes matching nostrils you've got two arms two shoulders and so forth any exercise that in crosses the midpoint that vertical midpoint down the middle of your body um, is called educational kinesiology and it's another way of getting the corpus callosum to work you often see it with professional sports people if you're watching Wimbledon for example you'll see someone will take the racket in their right hand and swing it behind them and touch their left foot and then they'll swing the, the racket to their other hand and touch their other foot and they'll be doing this exercise I don't have a tennis racket so I can't demonstrate but you can use the human body to increase um, relaxation. So apology that this is all talk. Normally if I were running a face-to-face -face class, I'd get you do, doing some of these things. Very mm. much part of creativity is the notion of practice. Practice, with that's, a, that's the verb practice. That's the doing. Um, there's a very great photographer called Platon if you don't know his work look him up and this is a famous quote you must master technique to the point you will completely integrate it forgetting about it like you don't think about breathing that's crucial then you're able to focus on the creative part of the story so another reason for practicing that's why if you're um, I don't know you're learning a musical instrument let's say you're learning the piano you learn the scales because you integrate those scales into your uh, into your into your body it becomes part of part of muscle memory and the most basic advice i give given that a mojo is a single operator generally so you are doing the filming and then you are doing the editing uh, you shoot to edit when you when you plan your your shots plan your filming you're bearing in mind that you are going to be doing the editing. So you're trying to make the, um, the editing process as simple as possible. So I'm going to give you a series of creative tips. Number one, uh, use the, the size of the smartphone. 
it's a small device it's a mobile device so you unlike a traditional broadcast television camera that I used to use back in the 80s these massively heavy things you can use the compactness the tininess of the smartphone to, to do things like strap it to a skateboard or uh, uh, I used to use when I lived in Hong Kong I used to do a lot of filming out of these uh, clear lifts so you could get in the lift and get some nice shots of the of the lift going up or down or getting on travelators um, you know that's those travelators are those long things you see at um, at airports or um, film people's feet or get close-ups of people's nervously fidgeting with their hands again I'm, I'm having to talk about this normally I would be if we were in a face-to-face -face class I would be showing you these things so use the size of the smartphone uh, I'm going to suggest to you that there are many different styles of mojo um, if I were teaching you uh, television journalism you would know that there's a 70 80 year history of, of of television news so it has it's developed a language of its own mojo has yet to develop its own language so there's no one way of doing mojo is what i'm saying so you can emulate traditional tv packages that's one way of doing mojo you can use things like natural sound to drive the story you can use text as narration rather than voice you can do slideshows you can you can use the interviewee as the narrator you can use music to tell your story there there's no one set way of doing most this is the story i told you about where um, between pressing record with my smartphone on the edge of the stage and having the story on the website of the South China Morning Post took about two and a, just over two and a half minutes. This is predicated obviously on, on doing some decent research. So I knew that this magician was going to make an attempt on the Guinness World Record for the most number of costume changes in in one minute. I knew I was going to, only going to be filming for a minute, so I set my, uh, my mobile phone up on its tripod. I, could, I got as close as I could. It's not great footage, and this is back in 2013, so the it would have been a iPhone 3 or 4, something like that. So the quality of the footage is not great. But I basically <clears throat> set it up, pressed record when the, the when the music started, um, pressed stop when he when he finished his minute of, and then I took a couple of um, couple pieces of footage when he's being given the um, the award because I, he did achieve the his mission. Um, you'll hear a, <clears throat> a, a, a like a siren blasted around about the. 52nd point and that's was to tell him that he had 10 seconds left to complete his mission i then sat there on on the side of the stage edited the one minute with a, with a, a with the presentation so the video is now about a minute and 10 and then i uploaded via a wi-fi dongle to the website of the south china morning post i had pre-written the story in other words, I'd pre-written the couple of uh, sentences of introduction, had two versions, and then basically I fired off the the video, and the producer back in the uh, back in the newspaper combined the story and put it out, and we we had it out on the website in about two and a half minutes, let's say three minutes after I first first hit record. So here's the finished result.
I also said it was, it's a bit old now, but it shows it's possible to make a mojo story from the field very quickly, predicated upon decent research and preparation. Um, another example of a story um, is using natural sound. One of the big uh, racing events was taking place in Macau. Macau is a small island off, off the south coast of China. It's about an hour and a bit in a fast ferry from Hong Kong. So I <clears throat> got myself off to Macau to watch the rehearsal prior to the actual event. So we did a preview story about the Grand Prix coming up. I'd never been to a, a Grand Prix in my life. And what hit me was the sound, the, the noise of these racing cars. So I decided to let the, the sound, the audio, tell the story, which meant there was no narration. The only narration I could do was using text. give the sense of speed, I found a bridge um, and, the, and you can see that that metal grid is to stop people from falling on the track. So I leaned over the bridge with, and held out my phone and, and got, the, got the cars um, from above. An example of using um, the, the compactness. I mean, I could not do this with a, with a big broadcast quality camera. But by leaning out over the bridge and holding my phone out, I got some footage. Another story, uh, this one is shot in, uh, more recently in, uh, in the Greek island of Lemnos. Soldiers and nurses from seven nations are buried here at the Portianos Military Cemetery on the Greek island of Lemnos. Three days of ceremonies have been held this week to mark the centenary of the Allied landing at Gallipoli in April 1915 and to mark also Lemnos's role in that campaign. More than 900 soldiers and nurses are buried at the three Commonwealth war graves on the island. Lemnos became a major hospital base where the wounded from Gallipoli were shipped. Canada's ambassador, Robert Peck, unveiled a plaque for nurses who died during the campaign. I'm going to pause slightly to make a few points. Um, it took me 26 hours to get to this island of Lemnos, which is quite close to the border, uh, to the to just off the coast of um, of, um, of Turkey, even though it's um, a Greek island owned by the Greeks. Um, 26 hours of travel, 20 minutes of filming, 30 minutes of editing, sitting under a, a tree I'll show you later on. Um, and then 
so I I had a really I was on a very really slow network I managed to send my story off um, it went to an Australian newspaper because this was these were Australian troops marking the hundredth anniversary of the Gallipoli in uh, fiasco I sent my story it took about an hour for the story to be delivered on an incredibly slow Wi-Fi network and it was only after I sent it that I realized I'd misspelled the surname of the mayor of Lemnos so the correction on the video took only a few seconds I one of the vowels was wrong but I had to phone the news desk tell them to delete the video and then resend so my lesson there is even though you can be very fast making a mojo video <laughs> um, it's easy to make a mistake because you're a single operator you've got no one um, looking at your material over your shoulder as you would with a television crew to spot m mistakes so I lost several hours of time um, in making one very simple mistake so one of the things I really recommend to you is when you've finished making your video if you're a single operator put it aside for a few minutes make a cup of tea go to the bathroom and then look at it again hopefully with more objective eyes and that way you won't make the mistake of wasting out all the hours and embarrassment having to cancel uh, the original video um, also it's missing it's missing a, an interview there needs to be an interview because it's a news story and uh, I lined up an interview with a, a historian and the bugger I arranged to meet him and he just never turned up so there's no video interview in this story um, the great thing about it was that I could be sitting on the grass next to this soldier and filming right in the middle of things I wasn't having to be um, on the peripheral I could be right in the middle getting getting my foot and that's how you could hear the the thump of his boots as he walks across the grass after the horrors of the trenches of Gallipoli Australia's soldiers spoke fondly of the friendliness of the people of the island of Lemnos <laughs> This is the Australian National Anthem, if you're not aware. So I decided to blend the music with the video. So I was getting tired of the sound of my own voice. sun and in the morning we will remember them so it's nice to be able to get some footage of the sun going down lest we forget there's the tree where I did the uh, video editing you can also do very quick news stories this one was just filmed in the in the park just being alert to possibilities so I found I was in a park in Beijing and I saw this lovely old man painting. That's a natural sound. No need for me. It's, these are just nice pictures. Other ways of telling story are using a combination of music and text. Here is an example where this is from Portugal. Um, again, some years ago, so the images quality is pretty poor. But I interviewed somebody in this cathedral and used their voice as a narration.
one of the stories more famous here in the city. It's about the famous nun that live here in the convent. She was Mariana Alcufurado. So a lot of these images I just grabbed off, um, off the web. And also I bought a few postcards from the convent, which gave me the, the images. They're not great, but I was trying, struggling a bit to find ways to illustrate the story. And uh, one day she saw through her window in the convent a French knight that, were, that was here, in this case, uh, helping the, the Portuguese troops to fight against Span the Spanish uh, troops. And she saw the knight passing through her window and she fell in love with him. Months later he returned again to France and uh, she wrote him five letters that uh, were later published. Uh, Les Lettres Portugaises. Uh, she always hoped that he returned again to, to, to live with her. Um, it's a famous story that it's related with the convent and with the city uh, of Beja. They ever meet, did they? We don't know. We can't prove that. We can't think, yes. We can't imagine. Who knows? Yes. They could have physical contact more than the eye contact, so... But we don't have proofs. We can read the letters and imagine. So I'm not saying that's a great video, but it's an example of where you just have to use the f what's around you. And so I, I just grabbed some footage and some, some um, postcards from, from the convent shop. Uh, another one using music. Uh, this one's a little more recent. Using music as a motif. So this is a, a famous group of musicians. I'm going to now talk about some basic principles, some tips, I suppose you call them. So, um, a technique I like to use is shooting through frames. So, frames are anything that create a frame. Window frames, posts, trees, fence posts, and frames within frames, um, using the viewfinder of another person's video camera. Um, so here's an example. Um, I did a story about the world's most northerly vineyard, because I've, some of you may know I write about wine as well. So here's an example of filming a frame in a frame. So I'm inside the, the winery looking at the vines. You can see I've used the frames. I take a couple the barn of pace... that Casa has been converted into a restaurant. So, so I, I take an extra pace closer. I've still got a frame. I can I get a better view of the uh, of the exterior. Serving traditional Norwegian food. Site has unique accommodation. Who stays there? We have a lot of guests coming here to stay overnight to, to sleep in the three barracks that we have, uh, and, and do. And another example is using Norwegian the frames. Reasonable. So this is the doorway of the uh, of the barrel. So he's converted these huge wine barrels into accommodation and people, people, there's a five year waiting list apparently last time I was there. Um, so you can see I've got the frame of the doorway, the frame of the barrel, and you can see the frame of the windows in the background. Pole, wine Monopoly, uh, and they bought uh, wine in, in uh, big barrels, 6,500 litres, and now it's a, it's a small twin bedroom. So that's what I mean by using frames within frames. Another example, again, this 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 is a um, this is a story about an olive tree, which is the oldest in southern Italy. Um, it was combined with a package about a um, a virus, a bacteria, sorry, that was infecting thousands millions of olive trees in in italy a story i did for the guardian years ago is an example of another way of framing so i i set i got on the other side of the tree and again this was shot with a fairly ropey old camera mobile phone 
but again using the frame of the tree and then the the the, the, the stones that are supporting it to give you an interesting angle course of its shape and age the tree has become something of a media star the technique i like to use is using wind and movement so you film the movement of wind through or over leaves or grass or flowers or clouds crossing the sky in slow motion um, again continuing the um, the uh, wine analogy this time I shot a sunset through a wine glass an interesting technique you can often get um, by using by filming things through other things you get interesting images um, I also like to use textures and patterns um, and you get these textures and patterns by filming things like rusting iron, blistered paint, the rough tree bark, um, renovated brickwork, pebbles, rocks um, and also water, the movement of water. So I did a story about um, uh, some, it was connected with the with the Norwegian composer Edvard Grieg. Another trick I like to use is filming things in reflection. So instead of filming a building you film a reflection of, a, of that building in a puddle or a lake or a um, and using another technique as nice is to shoot something from a distance where it's ref so the building is reflected you've got the vertical of the building and the reverse of that building reflected in the in the lake so water and mirrors are really interesting ways to get interesting images. Uh, another technique I like to use is using filters that you find on location. Uh, you find an old leaf, a, a, a desiccated leaf, and shoot images like to shoot the sun through a leaf. Um, film something through a, a piece of linen cloth use the the grid the holes on the back of a chair um, one thing i like that i discovered fairly recently was finding a sieve a sieve is that device that you use to uh, filter the flour when you're baking you hold a sieve up against um, a face and film the face through the very fine grid pattern of the sieve get some really interesting angles and images Reflections, shadows and contrasts are also very powerful. Um, it's a great way to focus the viewer's attention. So an example is the, is, um, the lights on the cakes or the candles will focus. You can just see the shadow of a person's face. Another thing that's worth thinking, and you'll have to think about this one, is what I call visual metaphors. So how can you express something that's, that's conceptual, theoretical, like an emotion, um, using images? So by putting a smartphone in a plastic bag, or modern smartphones um, are allegedly waterproof, I'm not willing to test it. So you put it in a case or a bag, and you can illustrate something like... It's like drowning in the ocean. You're stuck in its dark blue depths. Every time your head pops above the waves, another one comes crashing in. Even if you think you've gotten out, the ocean is still there. Requires a bit of thought, and a bit of initiative, and a bit of creativity, but finding ways to create visual metaphors. Also, look for unusual angles. You know, and, and one way to do that is, is to the filming term is the Dutch angle. Basically, you play with the horizon. So that's one version of, of filming. And all that's happened here is just tilting your viewfinder a little bit, a few degrees one way or another. And you get a, 
a different image. Listening is very important. So wherever I go, I use the audio recorder on my smartphone to record distinctive pieces of music. Um, you can also use music in videos. So here's a video from Lisbon. I was on holidays and I just shot this for a bit of fun. is just keeping your eyes open and listening and looking um, so you can often capture interesting images just by sitting in a cafe and, and watching so I was in in Pushkar in India a couple of years ago sitting on dusk having a cup of tea looking at the lake and this event unfolded <laughs> to save time when you're filming is to film in sequences rather than single shots. Some of you will be familiar with the book that Evo Burham and I wrote called Mojo. Here's one of the videos from the book which illustrates what I mean by shooting sequences. G'day, uh, my name's Evo and in this video we're going to learn how to cover an unfolding event. Not as a series of individual shots, but more as a sequence. I've heard it said that we should consider the five so shot rule when we're actually covering something. I guess that's a close up of what we're seeing, a close up of who's doing it, uh, a wider relational shot to show where it is, maybe a point of view shot, um, maybe also a special shot. That's one way of doing it. 
Uh, but in, in the 30 years that I've been doing this, I've never found that there's enough time to do that with an unfolding event. In fact, you can generally do that and prepare that and plan that in a documentary or a drama or a corporate, but not at the scene of an accident or a news event, where you're better off treating it as a sequence and covering the event as a sequence. If you cover it as a sequence, a number of things will happen. One is that you'll be in the story, more in the story, covering the story. Two is you won't slow the actuality, the unfolding event down and the policeman or the ambulance driver or whoever won't kick you off the scene. And thirdly is you will end up with more shots, like magic almost, hard to believe but it's true. So I'll show you how to do that. But the first thing we have to do is to make sure that our subject, which is Claire today, is lit properly. Now, in this case, I'm standing on, the, on this side looking out into a big window, and that's not the right thing to do, because in a big window, the exposure is going to be all wrong, and Claire is going to be dark. So we don't want that. So the best thing for us to do, unless we've got a light where we can light Claire to match the outside exposure, is to walk around the other side. Now, over here, I'm on the same side as the light. So there's the light, and here's me, and there's the subject. So, so over here, as you can see, I've got absolutely no problems, no problems with my uh, exposure at all. So this is where we'll do it from. It's not as nice a shot as looking out in that beautiful garden, but because you're working fast and because we don't want to slow things down, we actually try and shoot the way the light is, 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 is moving. So the light's coming from here to here and that's the way that we'll shoot. So the light's on the subject and we're looking the same way. So here goes. What we're going to do, we're going to shoot three shots. But we're not going to shoot them as shots. We're going to shoot them as a sequence. We're not going to stop and save each shot. And we're going to shoot a close-up, which shows us what we're doing, a close-up of the iPhone. We're going to shoot a shot of Claire's face, which shows us who's doing that. We're going to then shoot a wider shot, um, a relational shot, which, which relates the, the iPhone to the person and to the space. Okay? So there's the story. We've covered the story. This is being done. This is who's doing it. And this is where it's being done. If we ask Claire why she's doing this, we'll get an answer, which will be another one of the five W's. And then if I write a little voiceover, we might get the fifth W, which is the when. So we might answer our five W's just in this little sequence. Okay, so let's see how this goes. So we start filming now, and we do a few seconds of that. We then move up gently. We see who's doing it. A few seconds of that. And then we move out here and we see a relational shot between Claire and the device. And Claire, why are you doing this? I want to win the $10,000 first prize so that I can pay for my next year of uni. So it's really that simple. That's how you cover a sequence. And, uh, and as I said, one, two, three shots. But if you run it as a sequence, you can use a little bit of that one with the move up. That gives you a fourth shot. A little bit of that one with the move out. That gives you a fifth shot. Or use the whole lot as a sequence. That gives you a sixth shot. So twice as many shots if it's covered as a sequence. And also, we haven't, we haven't slowed Claire down at all, right? So let's see what that looks like. If I add a voiceover to it, we'll see if we can make a little story out of that. So there it is. Um, we've uh, added... Uh, uh, shots, we've added the, uh, uh, the wide shot. There's a <clears throat> this was uh, the app he's using is called Vodio, which is a very fine app, but it was a startup and they went out of business. Uh, so the app hasn't been developed for a few years now, so we don't recommend it anymore. It's a close up there, close up of Claire and I've included the uh, a voiceover underneath that to give it some context and to give us the when, uh, uh, some music, and Claire's, uh, and Claire's little piece to camera about why she's doing it and her name super. And underneath all that, we've put some music. Let's have a look at what that, uh, what that all looks and sounds like. Here we go. Every year, the Go Mojo National Smartphone Competition has people like Claire from all over Australia practicing their digital storytelling skills. I want to win the $10,000 first prize so that I can pay for my next year of uni. So that's how you cover a sequence, and that's how you edit it together on a smartphone with a little bit of voiceover, a bit of music, a name super, and you've got a complete package. I'm mean, now going to use. Uh... A sequence uh, from one of my favourite movies, Fargo, by the great Coen brothers, to 
further illustrate this notion of filming in in sequence and how it saves you time. This is quite early in the movie. Um, we've got a storm raging. You have to imagine the storm clouds and raging winds. An extreme long shot of of the snow and, and, and isolation and coldness. This is only for a few seconds. And then we cut to a fence line and a person struggling along the fence line in, in a long shot. And then we have a medium shot of an overturned car. And there's our main character, the, the wonderful Francis McDiarmid. Um, uh, and we see, and then we see a medium shot and we see the body in the background of the person we saw earlier. Now, in the space of about eight to ten seconds, the story has been told. Let's look at some numbers. Um, I recommend to students when they're learning to, to film that you work on a ratio of one to eight to sixteen. That's the three basic shots, long, medium and close. So for each long shot, you need six to eight medium shots and at least double that number of close-ups. Why? Because Mojo is quite an intimate medium. So you're going to spend a lot more time filming detail close-ups than you are long shots. So we only need a couple of long shots, mostly as establishing shots to set the scene. This is not a hard rule, but I find it useful when you're planning your shots to think in terms of a lot more close-ups than long shots. Um, for that reason, Mojo's not very good for covering, say, a sporting event, a cricket match or a football match. You're too far away from the action uh, to do. But what you can do with Mojo is use the intimacy to get the reaction shot. So when a wicket falls or a goal is scored, you then get the reaction of the crowd. So that's where Mojo and its closeness, its intimacy is more powerful. Usually Mojo stories involve interviews and finding a good location is very important. I recommend f filming interviews in with soft furnishings because that improves the acoustics, the quality of the sound. Um, you need uh, something to stabilize your camera so you're not getting any wobble. And it it's helps to have, I think, some background action or movement rather than filming something against a wall. Um, this brings in the notion of the energy point. So if you turn on the grid in your smartphone in settings, you'll notice that those four red pluses are the energy points. And ideally, you want your action happening on those energy points. In the case of an interview, it's the eyes you're looking to put on the energy points. So here's two potential ways to interview somebody. And, in, and notice I've interviewed them in a corridor looking down the corridor, not against the white wall, creamy coloured wall. Um, one of those looks better than the other. The top right would look okay if the person were on the left, the left axis energy point. But I've got them on the right energy point. When you're interviewing people to get them to say, say to them, would you mind moving your shoulder back or forward so that you get um, as in the case of bottom left, as you correctly identified, it just looks better. Um, by doing the interview in the corridor, you've got stuff happening in the background. So I think that looks better than interviewing somebody against a wall. You get a sense of movement, a sense of action happening. Avoid doing your interviews against, against walls. If you must, then have at least a meter, a yard between the person and the wall. Because this is what happens when you put the person too close to a wall. Ethereal and hard. <clears throat> so um, when I was working in Hong Kong, 
we were told to use this backdrop when we did our in-studio interviews. When you put someone, especially someone with, with darker skin, against a wall, a lighter wall, it magnifies the size of their head. Another thing to be careful of is, uh, is some, some boxes, some frames, some things that people use as a cage to hold their mobile phone, um, sometimes they distort. So you can see that during this interview, um, the bookcase, the frame of the bookcase has got distorted which looks very, very odd. Always best to do a couple of test shots before you actually start uh, running your interview. Be careful when filming inside, uh, because if you're shooting under fluorescent lights, you get some pretty weird looking skin tones. So here is a, an interview I did with a winemaker in a wine bar. It was nice to have all that clinking sound and the bottles and the imagery, but look at the terrible, terrible... Um... Sometimes the pinfold's terrible, terrible skin tones and lighting. Um, I'm, I kept this, it's embarrassing, but I, it's probably still on the website somewhere, but not something I'm proud of because it just... Unless I was trying to be arty-farty, which I wasn't. It was meant to be, meant to be a news story. I'm just about to finish, but I recommend the work of Richard Lackey. He's got a, a really good website and YouTube site. Um, and he's got a really good video on cinematic shooting. Um, I so have a look at that. Some really good stuff on it. Um, so have a look at his website. Um, I think it's richardlackey.com from memory. Yeah. Have a look at his stuff. Um, my notes at, on my website might you might find useful. Um, most of what I'm talking about today was in um, lesson three. There's a whole there's I think eleven lessons from when I teach in Norway.